Hi, how are you going? There are a lot of you here um, that I don't know. Maybe that's better. I'm Matt, by the way. Um, no, oh, thanks, 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 Sue. Um, I love what Mark said about when we were doing um, communion, and and he he brought up the part where Jesus said, "Not my will, but yours," and that really ties in with what I'm talking tonight. Um, Jesus recognised the authority of the Father, and Jesus was obedient to the Father. Authority and obedience. It's going to consume what I'm saying tonight. Um, my, I was asked to preach on faith and the gift of faith. Um, I'll be talking a little bit about the gift of faith and I'll also be talking about faith in, in itself. And uh, if I want to Australianise what my sermon is about, it's put your money where your mouth is. And Paul, Paul writes in Corinthians that, about the gifts and eagerly design the spiritual gifts, but he also writes, as we've gone through 1 Corinthians, that the greatest gift is love and that everything we should do should be out of love for our brothers and sisters. And, um, and I'm hoping you'll accept this word tonight in love. Because I'm, I'm sure it's going to, uh, not offend, hopefully make you think, maybe challenge mindsets. We, um, we all have preconceived ideas from growing up, from all the interactions we do in our lives. And, and, we have, and the person sitting next to you can have a totally different preconceived idea to what you have. And some, a lot of time we're not aware of it. And, um, and I suppose I just want to uh, bring a few things out about that. Because our preconceived ideas generally are born out of our soul. And we've got to, we've got to change our thinking because our, our ideas have to line up with God, which is spirit. First thing I want to do is uh, challenge you on the concept of um, who we are compared to God and where we are compared to God. Um, I, was, I was watching something the other day, well, when, and when I say the other day, it might be the six months ago or whatever, and this person was talking about the, um, the greatness of God, and, um, and a few facts were thrown out, so I, had a, I checked them out, and I thought, oh, that's really good. So I'm just going to make sure I've got my notes so I know I, I don't muck any of this up. Um, as, a, as a mathematics teacher, I love the, the fact of the speed of light. I would love to be able to travel at the speed of light. I like travelling at fast speeds. I'm not allowed to travel at fast speeds. That's what the law is in this land, and we have to come under that authority. Um, that's why I like going to Germany. Unlimited speed, and it's fantastic. And when we were over there, actually, with my... We were over there in 2013, and, and when we were driving, I might have shared this before, but um, uh, Janine doesn't like speed. And when she fell asleep, when we were driving on the autobahn, my kids went, go faster, Dad, go faster. And so I did. And... Um, and then Janine woke up, I don't know, 20 minutes, half an hour later, and we were doing around 190 kilometres an hour flying along past the police, which I thought was fantastic because that normally doesn't happen in Australia. And uh, as soon as she woke up, was slow down. Uh, I did what every good husband would do, and I, I listened to my wife and I slowed down. So the speed of light. Um, and so when we're talking about the speed of light, this is the understanding I want us to get. Um, Scientists say, oh, and understand the speed of light. Light travels around the Earth seven and a half times in one second. That's how fast speed of light is. Seven and a half times around the world in a second. You'll get to the moon in just over a second. Speed of light. The sun is eight minutes light minutes away. All right. So I'm sure we'd feel it beforehand, but you know, if the sun blew up, we'd still have light for eight minutes before it disappeared down here. Some of the star when you're looking at the stars, when you go and look at the stars tonight, you are looking at what happened four million light years ago. 
Okay, we're, look, we're looking at the past when we're talking about the speed of light. So, with that in mind, our Milky Way galaxy is 10,000 by 100,000 light years big. 10,000 by 100,000 light years big. And our galaxy is apparently, scientists believe, only one of 200 billion other galaxies in the heavens. How big is our God? Put up Isaiah 40, 12, thanks. Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand or with the breadth of his hand marked off the heavens? What can you measure in the breadth of your hand? How big is our God? He measures the heavens in the breadth of his hand. It's in the word. So next time you have a problem, or you think you have a problem, if it's night, go outside and have a look up. Maybe it'll remind you. How big is your problem? How big is our universe? How much bigger is our God that we serve and that we give our authority to? All right. Faith. I love my dragons, my St George team. I actually thought of wearing one of my jumpers tonight. <coughs> what are you laughing for? They're not St George ones though. They're just, they're just my pink ones. That's okay. Um, I love my dragons, right? So I'm going to make a statement. I believe they're going to win the grand final in 2025. Are you with me, John? Yes. I didn't know that. Now... Put your money where your mouth is. What am I willing? What am I willing to put on that? Nothing. My neighbour across the road's a big Penrith supporter, and he's he's just won four in a row. He's very happy, chabby. He would probably say, "Can I say this in church?" He said, "I'd bet you a slab of beer." That's about sixty to eighty dollars. Would I be willing to put that on? My faith in my team winning. What about my house? Let's go, let's ramp it right up. Would I be willing to put the value of my house in my statement, the Dragons will win the grand final in 2025? Would I be willing to do that? Most of you are saying, would I be stupid enough to do that? But would I be willing to do that? Would I be willing to give my life? For that statement. I'm just trying to lay a platform for you. I'd like to call for two volunteers. Oh, Fraser and Cato, well, fantastic. Come on up. They haven't been prepped earlier. Um, okay, is this a good spot? Okay. Yes. Here I have two two volunteers. Once again, yeah, give it up. Okay. So I'm going to ask them some questions and just let's see their response. All right. You might want to just uh, come this way, Fraser. Here we have a seat, a chair. It's an innate object. It doesn't need it. It won't understand your praise. Okay. Okay. Fraser, do you believe that chair will hold you up if you sit in it? No. Just say yes. Yes. Look at the chair. Yes. Ah! 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 Yes, then no. Do you believe that chair will hold you if you sit in it? Yes, then no. Yes, then no. No, yes. <laughs> Say yes. Yes. Sit in the chair. No. Right, you got it. <sighs> and they say, <laughs> they say never work with children or animals, but anyway. 
<laughs> Kato. Kato. <laughs> it's all good. Do you believe that chair will hold you? Uh, yes. Sit in the chair. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, uh, so who displayed their faith? Did, did Fraser display the faith in the chair? Did he say he had faith in the chair? Okay. But, so did Fraser have faith in the chair if he didn't display the faith in the chair? How was he, uh, how was Cato able to display his faith? By the action. Good. All right. We'll do another one, not the chair. We'll see how they go. Fraser. Do you believe that if you fall backwards, I will catch you? Yeah. Turn around, fall back. No. Right. Okay, we played this game as kids. Did anyone else do this? Kato, do you believe that if you fall backwards, I will catch you? Only yes. Okay, turn around, fall backwards. All right, so another example, okay, who, who showed their faith in me catching them? Cato, how did he show that faith? The action. Who didn't? Okay, Fraser, okay. So when I'm talking a little bit later, okay, just so you, you've got that in there, okay, dead faith, <laughs> dynamic faith. Okay, thank you. No slide on you whatsoever, Fraser. It was all acting. It was all acting. Okay. So I just wanted to do that little kind of thing. See, there was an obedience there to the instructor who was me. Okay, and they either put the authority in me to, to follow or, or not with the dead faith versus the dynamic faith. Okay, so here's my statement that may shake a few things. If your faith hasn't changed you, I'm going to question your faith to begin with. If your faith hasn't changed you, I'm going to question the faith to begin with. Your faith should change how you live, act, respond to your circumstances in your everyday life. And this isn't just me. I'm going to read some verses from the Bible, some words that Jesus said that say that. All right. Remember how big our God is. Who do we give our authority to? And therefore, who do we give our obedience to? Okay, can we pop up John 1.27? Uh, this is from, um, this is in the book of John, but it is John the Baptist that is speaking here. So John the Baptist is getting bailed up by the Pharisees and the Sadducees in the temple, and they're asking him, are you the Messiah, or should we be looking for somebody else? Okay, and, and John, of course, was the, um, what did I say, was the, the new Elijah who, who foretold the Messiah's coming. What does John say about Jesus? He is the one who comes after me, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. We need to change our perception about service and obedience because in our soul, we want to go, I want to be in charge. I want to be doing my thing. I don't want to come under obedience. That's our soul. Our soul wants to think of service as slavery or bondage. And it's really a, it's a divine thing. It's a spiritual concept. And, it, and, and having been a servant, given the authority over to who we believe... And understanding, and understanding who God is and what Christ did for us, 
it's not a negative life of suppression as people would think or is that our in the natural in our soul that we would think it's actually a positive life of newness and freedom can we put up John 3.21? This is from the NLT. This is Jesus speaking. Jesus speaking to Nicodemus. Now, remember the example that we just did with, with um, Fraser and Cato. So Jesus talking to Nicodemus. Nicodemus was a Pharisee and he came in secret. You know, he, he didn't want to be seen by others. He's talking to Jesus. And Jesus finishes the statement with this. But those who do what is right come to the light so others can see that they are doing they are doing what god wants not just saying what not just saying they are doing what god wants so jesus is speaking there to nicodemus and he's telling him our actions are seen by others this is um another one luke 17 5 to 10. this for for <laughs> For years and years and years, I've always glossed over. And I've probably been more hung up by the mustard seed and not read on. But I'm going to read a little further because Jesus is responding to the disciples. The disciples are saying to him, increase our faith. This is in Luke 17, 5 to 10. The apostles said to the Lord, show us how to increase our faith. The Lord answered, if you have the faith even as small as a mustard seed, you could say to this mulberry tree, may you be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it would obey you. That's where I stopped. And that's where I, I was like, oh, how cool would that be? I don't think I'd have that sort of faith. But Jesus goes on in the same vein. And he said, when a master comes in from ploughing or taking care of the sheep, does his master say, Come in and eat with me. No. He says, prepare my meal, put on your apron and serve me while I eat. Then you can eat later. And does the master thank the servant for doing what he is told to do? Of course not. In the same way, when you obey me, you should say, we are unworthy servants who, are simple, who have simply done our duty. The apostles started with a question, show us how to increase our faith. And that's how Jesus responded to them. So, for me, that teaches that faith is all about obedience and servant, having a servant heart, heart, sorry. And who's it obedience to? It's obedience to God. I want to be clear though, because I know, I know, and this has been a, a great theological debate, and, and I'm, I'm going to address it. Um, there's saving faith and there's the gift of faith and I also want to make clear what I'm talking about is not faith plus works I'm not talking about faith plus works faith alone saves but the faith that saves is never alone I'll just repeat that faith alone saves but the faith that saves is never alone we're not saved by works but we're saved for works. Paul writes this in Ephesians. Let's put up Ephesians 2, 8 to 10. And I chose the New King James Version. And it says, For by grace you've been saved through faith, and not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should both boast. Amen. Thank you, Jesus, for that. But then it says, For we are his workmanship, creating Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So by grace we've been saved through faith. All believers have saving faith. Not all believers, however, have the gift of faith, which Paul's writing about the gift of faith in what we're looking at with 1 Corinthians 12. The, gift of, the spiritual gift of faith was given for the common good. All the gifts of the Spirit are given for the common good, which means edifying the body of Christ. That means not everyone here may have the gift of faith through the Holy Spirit. And that's okay. We're all part of one body, and each body has... A, we're made up of different parts, and each body part has different gifts. 
And one's not better than the other. Paul, Paul makes that plain. And remember, he also makes it plain that love is the most important thing in all of them. And I just want to challenge your mind and understanding. Our spiritual gifts the Holy Spirit wants to give us or may have for us might be what we think. It mightn't be how we operate now in this physical world. So just because you are a you own a business and are a leader of an organisation doesn't mean that God wants to give you the lift of uh, give you the gift of leadership. He might, but it's not automatic. Just because I'm a teacher in the natural doesn't mean that I'm a I'm a teacher in the spiritual. It may happen, but it doesn't have to happen. And there's examples all through the Bible. We're reading the Old Testament. Hey. Moses, do you think he was a leader in, in the natural? What did God have for him? Okay. So, once again, by definition, every born-again believer has faith in Christ and faith to believe God's word. The gift of faith is talked about, um, and especially in... Uh, well, it's called the, the um, what is it? I'll get it. The Hall of Faith in Hebrews 11, chapter 11. And it lists a whole lot of people. Moses was one of them. Um, and seemingly these people just had an extraordinary amount of faith. One example, Noah. And we all about know about the story of Noah, don't we? We all know Noah built a boat and flooded and we used to sing songs at Sunday school about it and all that sort of stuff. Um, but when you look in the, in the story of Moses, uh, Noah, how long did it take him to build the boat? Does anyone know? 120 years to build that boat. And God said, I'm going to send rain that's going to flood the earth. Up until that point in time, there's no rain. Nothing's recorded about rain. So God's told this person, Noah, I'm going to do this, which has never been done before. Oh, by the, he didn't say, by the way, it'll be 120 years from now. He just said, do it. Do it. Noah, recognising the authority of God and who God is, obeyed. There's the outworking of his faith. There's his faith in action. Let's not, make, there you go. I won't use the word works. I'll use action. There's his faith in action. We'll come back to a few of the others. There's two polar opposites are mentioned, uh, and that's coming up a little bit later. But I also want to take a look at Jesus' example of faith. If you don't think I'm on the right, right uh, path, let's have a look at Matthew 8, 5 to 13. And this is when Jesus meets a Roman officer. And this talks all about authority and obedience. All about authority and obedience. When Jesus returned to Capernaum, a Roman officer came and pleaded with him, Lord, my young servant lies in bed, paralysed and in terrible pain. Jesus said, I'll come and heal him. But the officer said, Lord, I'm not worthy to have you come into my home. Just say the word from where you are and my servant will be healed. Whew. I know this because I'm under the authority of my superior officers and I have authority over my soldiers. I only need to say go and they go, or come, and they come. And if I say to my slaves, do this, they do it. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed. Jesus was amazed. Turning to those who were following him, he said, I'll tell you the truth, I haven't seen faith like this in all Israel. And I'll tell you this, many Gentiles will come from all over the world, from east and west, and sit down with Abraham, Isaac and Jacob at the feast in the kingdom of heaven. But many Israelites, those for whom the kingdom was prepared, will be thrown in outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing their teeth. Then Jesus said to the Roman officer, Go back home, because you believed it has happened. And the young servant was healed that same hour. 
What was Jesus expressing here to the people that he was talking to about the Roman officer? What, was he, what point was he making when he said, I haven't seen faith like this anywhere in Israel? Not even from any of the, not even from any of the religious leaders of the day. Jesus saw that he understood authority and obedience. Authority and obedience. And, he, and we need to be on that same path. We need to obey our authority, who we put in authority. So, who have you given authority to in your life? It's actually a simple question. It's either God or it's not God. And if it's not God, it's the enemy of God. By default. By default. Understanding that faith is built on who we give our authority to and therefore who we should be obedient to. Now I want to have a focus on a passage from uh, James that is contentious and sometimes even misunderstood. So I want us to put up James 2, 20 to 26. And sometimes, you know, this, this is with theologians have, have argued that this actually goes against what Paul writes. But I think if we have a really good look without, say, preconceived ideas, you'll see that, as someone explained it, it's Paul and James working back to back, fighting a different enemy. Let's just read. How foolish. Can't you see that faith without good deeds is useless? And some, some uh, uh, interpretations say dead. Dead. Don't you remember that our ancestor Abraham was shown to be right with God by his actions when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see, his faith and his actions worked together. His actions made his faith complete. And so it happened, just as the scripture says, Abraham believed God and God counted him as righteousness because of his faith. He was even called the friend of God. So you see, we are shown to be right with God by what we do, not by faith alone. Rahab the prostitute is another example. She was shown to be right by God by her actions when she hid those messengers and sent them safely away by a different road. Just as the body is dead without breath, so also faith is dead without good works, good actions. Let's not get caught up in that. I love the contrast James uses here. The moral man versus the immoral woman. Abraham, Rahab. How dare we talk about a prostitute in church? They might blow a few preconceived ideas as well. Both are talked about in Hebrews 11. Interestingly enough, do you know who Rahab, uh, who Rahab was in the scheme of things? Are we aware? Rahab was a mother of Boaz. Rahab was a great-great-grandmother of King David. Rahab is where the lineage of Jesus Christ came through. Who do we give our authority to and who are we obedient to? So let's look at Abraham. And we all know the story of Abraham, generally. In Genesis 15, God took Abraham stargazing. <laughs> Remember what we said earlier? Go ahead and have a look at the stars. And what did God say to Abraham? He said, I'm going to make your descendants greater than the stars you see in the sky. He gave him a promise. What was Abraham's reaction? How did Abraham show that he gave God, he had believed in the authority of God and was obedient to him? How did he express his faith? What did Abraham say? In the, in the actual... Hebrew translation, the word just means Abraham said, Amen. Amen. You said it, it's true. Amen. Now, 
This is when Abraham was a, a very old man, much older than me, much older than some of you. And, and it says in there, God credited to him as righteousness. How old was Abraham's wife? She was past the age of childbearing. And yet in all those natural circumstances, this is, what we've got to, this is how we have to apply this with our life today. In all those natural circumstances, Abraham believed. And then Abraham obeyed. How did he obey that also went against natural circumstances? Well, that came about 20 years later after he had a son called Isaac. What did God say? Go and take your son. Love the language. Go and take your son, your only son, to sacrifice him. What does that sound like? Did Abraham put his money where his mouth is? Yes, he did. In fact, if we read, if we read in, in the, the scriptures about it, Abraham goes with his servants and their donkeys and all that sort of stuff and they go up to the hill and then he says to his, his servants, wait here, we will return. We will return. He didn't say, I'll be back. He said, we will return. Abraham's faith was shown by his obedience to who he put his authority in, our, our God. Rahab. In Joshua 2, which we'll be up to soon in Daily Bread, there you go, there's another gratuitous plug. I've always got to put one in there and every time I speak. Daily Bread's great to read. In Joshua 2, Rahab's faith was justified by her actions. By her actions. Who was Rahab? She, was, she lived in Jericho. She was a Canaanite. She wasn't even a Hebrew. She wasn't even part of that mob that was supposed to be the chosen people of God. That are the chosen people of God, by the way. I don't mean that lightly. It's supposed to be, but I'm talking about a view that they would have had back then, thousands of years ago. But she put her faith in the Hebrew God that she'd heard about and heard about the wonderful things done for those people. So even though she wasn't one, and she acted upon it, the king of Jericho said, do this and hide them, we'll come and ambush them and, and it'll be all over and done with. And she went against the king's action. Remember I said about St George winning the premiership, would I put my life on it? Here's someone to put their life on it. Going against the action of the king of Jericho. She put her life, she put her money where her mouth is. She acted on a faith that she had in this Hebrew God. And that proved the genuineness of the faith. All right. I just want to leave with you a few things. This is my first wrap up, so I'll be another 10 or 15 minutes. Isn't that what, isn't that what you do, Peter? You just prepare people, my first wrap up. Okay, um, James in what we read, and if you look back a little bit in, in James 2 at the very start, and James is an interesting book. I, I like James in the sense that he's talking about maturing in the faith, growing, you know, going from infants to adults in the faith. But he talks about three types of faith. There are three types of faith. We only had, an action, we had two types up here. What were they? Dead faith and dynamic faith. And we want to, my challenge, I hope you've got the idea of what my challenge is. And by the way, I'm challenged with it too in saying it. I've been challenged with it. I'm still challenged with it. I'm continually challenged with it, as we all are and should be. There are three types. There's the dead faith. It's all in the head. I think when we read what Jesus talks about faith, I think we could possibly safely say that the Pharisees and Sadducees and the really religious rulers of Jerusalem had dead faith. It was all in the head. It's intellectual. There's nothing wrong with being intellectual. Don't hear what I'm not saying. But if that's not... If it's all right to say, oh, I know that chair will hold me intellectually. But if I'm not willing to 
shy about my actions, then that's dead faith, isn't it? So there's that one. We'll come to dynamic faith after because I'd, I'd like to leave on a positive. Do you, do you, do you realise there's demonic faith? The demons have a faith in God. It's all through the scripture. Um, just before, in, in one uh, verse before, in James 2.19, it says, Do you believe in God? James writing to the people, even the demons believe, and they tremble. Demons believe God exists. None of them are atheist or agnostic. They believe in the one God. They know the others are fake because they made them up. They believe in the deity of Jesus. If you don't believe me, in Mark 3, when Jesus, when they come across Jesus, they said, you are the Son of God. They understand his deity. They have a faith, but it's not saving faith. So they've got a faith. They believe in the place of eternal judgment. They pleaded. Legion. Legion begged Jesus not to send him to the abyss. They understand. They know. They believe Jesus will be the final and ultimate judge. In Matthew 8, they, say, they said to, to Jesus, have you come to torment us before the time? They know it's coming. They've got a faith. Is that going to save them? They tremble because they know. All right. And then there's dynamic faith. And that's where that's what we should be as believers focusing on and and following. Faith also always produce works. We are saved by faith, and I want to reiterate, we are saved by faith alone. But the faith that saves is never alone. There will always be an action to it. Faith is acting on what we know to be true. Faith is not believing in spite of evidence, but rather obeying in spite of consequence. It's not believing in spite of evidence, but obeying in spite of consequence. Jesus says in Matthew 7.21, Not everyone who calls out to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Only those who actually do the will of my Father in heaven will enter. Jesus also says in Luke 6, see, I, I want to make sure I've got stuff there that you can look and go and go away. Let the Holy Spirit speak to you while you read. When we, read the Bible, when we read the Bible, we need the Holy Spirit, don't we? We need the Holy Spirit. Luke 6, 43 to 49. Jesus, a good tree can't produce bad fruit, and a bad tree can't produce good fruit. A tree is identified by its fruit. Figs are never gathered from thorn bushes, and grapes not picked from bramble bushes. An evil person produces good uh, sorry, a good person produces good things from the treasury of a good heart and an evil person produces evil things from the treasury of an evil heart. What you say flows from what is in your heart. So why do you keep calling me Lord, Lord, when you don't do what I say? I will show you what it's like when someone comes to me, listens to my teaching and then follows it. It's like a person building a house who digs deep and lays the foundation on solid rock. When the flood waters rise and break against the house, it stands firm because it is well built. But anyone who hears and doesn't obey, it's like a person who builds a house right on the ground without a foundation. When the floods sweep down against that house, it collapse into a heap of ruins. So where to from here? I hope it's just as I am challenged and are continually challenged to be obedient and to submit to God's authority, I'm hoping that's what, what you get out of this too. 
some of us may need to repent before God because we have dead faith. That's okay. God, God's a loving God. God forgives us. And if you need to do that tonight, you can just, you can just pray to God and say, I'm sorry, and start living out your faith. Some of you mightn't have a faith. Some of you mightn't understand or mightn't know who this God is that we serve. And, and if that's you, or you mightn't be sure, and if that's you, I'd love to speak to you after. Peter would love to speak to you after. There's a whole lot of us here that love to speak to you after. We'd love to introduce you to our wonderful God and who he is and what he's done for us and how awesome he is. I think we'll just close in prayer. Comes up. God, we just thank you for who you are. Holy Spirit, I just pray that you reveal who you are to each one of us tonight. The understanding of who you are. Help us with our understanding of who God is. Help us to understand how to increase our faith. Give us the faith to submit to your authority and be obedient. Regardless of what we see. Because what you see is different. We thank you for we thank you for your son Jesus Christ, who took away, paid our penalty for our sin on that cross, once for all. We thank you you're a loving God who just loves us so much. Wants to be involved in every part of our life. And in that part, Lord, help us to understand what it means to be someone who is even unworthy to tie the shoelaces or the sandals back then. Amen. Hi, thanks for watching our video today. Our hope and prayer is that this video has drawn you closer to God and that it may have helped you think more about your relationship with him. If you'd like to be notified when we upload new videos, please click on the subscribe button below. And if you liked it, please click on the like button. If you can do this, it helps make it easier for us to spread the good news of Jesus Christ over YouTube. If you'd like to know more about us, God or knowing Jesus, please feel free to contact us via the email address at the bottom of this picture. God bless you and we look forward to seeing you again.